All right. So uh, this is Bill Price with GTA. Welcome back to the Georgia Technology Authority uh, Summit today. And um, this session is going to be about the state broadband grant program with uh, Dina Perry, executive director at DCA, uh, giving us a uh, walkthrough today. And hopefully uh, you have any questions, we'll take those at the end. Um, you can go ahead and submit them whenever you want to. Um, during the presentation, if you think of something as she's talking, and then I'll cover them off with her at the end. Dina, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Bill. Across the day, we have heard the benefits of connectivity, but more importantly, the disadvantages of not having access to robust internet service. In the last session, Eric McRae with CDOG spoke on the tools and resources available to communities in the pursuit of solving the digital divide. I'm Dina Perry, the Executive Director of the Broadband Department of Community Affairs. This afternoon, I want to provide an overview of the State Broadband Grant Program as part of the, as part of the coordinated effort with a project team that included representation of local governments, development authorities, broadband service providers. The rules and regs for the grant program were developed in accordance with legislation passed in 2018. If you attended the earlier session, you heard um, the mission of the Georgia Broadband Program is to promote the deployment of broadband services to unserved areas of the state. You also heard that the number one barrier in providing broadband services to rural Georgians is cost. This is due to population density and terrain. Both make it difficult to find a business model that will justify the build out without additional resources that it, and that is why public-private partnerships are key in finding solutions. Partnering with a private sector ISP brings expertise in designing, building, operating, and maintaining a broadband network, but also they bring capital. Local communities will play an essential role in bringing additional resources that can close the cost barrier gaps and to advocate where robust broadband services are needed. The GBDI team has been developing tools and augmenting resources to support public-private partnerships, and these tools will be available to applicants to aid in the project development when applying for state broadband funds. It is important that everyone is smart about why, how, where, and with whom we invest these in public resources. The Georgia Broadband Resources and Tools can be used for identifying Loca unserved locations for, for project area development and identifying and qualifying partners. Funding broadband has been a top priority for the governor and for the General Assembly. The state appropriated 30 million collectively for Y21 and Y22 budgets for broadband grants to the one Georgia eligible communities. The state broadband gr grants are designed to encourage broadband investment in unserved areas of the state. Public financial support is made available in the form of competitive grants for projects that will deploy quality high-speed internet service. These grants are intended to defray the cost of capital investment funding such activities as installation and expansion of required facilities equipment. The program is designed on three principles, maximizing the number of served locations, maximizing public investment, and minimizing risk. It is governed by the One Georgia Authority, so it is much like other infrastructure construction projects. However, the design and build and operations of broadband networks is very complex and needs expertise. Key differences in a broadband infrastructure project versus one other One Georgia infrastructure is the need for a qualified ISP partner and identifying specific unserved areas eligible for funding as well as the unserved locations. So who may apply? Eligible local governments and authorities who are qualified, who have partnered with a qualified broadband provider may apply for funds, which will be awarded through a competitive process any public authority or unit of local government in a One Georgia eligible or conditionally eligible county may apply for grant funding. 
applicants must partner with a qualified provider partner to deliver proposed services. How is a private provider partner selected? A qualified provider partner can be selected two ways, through an approved provider list or through a local procurement process. The approved provider list will be developed through what is going on currently, and it is a statewide RFP, a solicitation that interested providers can participate in. The end results after the qualifications will be a list of approved providers that local governments can select from to, to, to immediately, immediately partner with to develop and design projects. They may also use their local procurement processes, which um, would be a competitive bidding process um, and just following your own guidelines. If you are a local government with an existing broadband network that offers broadband services to end users, both residential and business, and plan to extend a network, you too are eligible to apply for the unserved areas um, for the state funding. GBDI has resources and data to identify potential qualified partners as co-investors. They bring expertise in design, build, operations, maintaining, which leads to maximizing investment and reducing risk. The GBDI team has identified which companies that are already operational ISPs in the state and are near or in the area, area of a project. Those that are already investing in broadband infrastructure and operations with financial and operational capacity and capabilities to support customers. Those already investing in the area should have a lower cost capable capability to build. In Georgia, we have telecom, cable, electric co-op, and a small number of city-based city ISPs. We have also identified which companies have or are receiving broadband funding from federal programs like FCC's ARDOF program and the USDA ReConnect grant program. They are already getting a co-investment from these programs and have been sent us to build and service customer locations. If they are near areas of proposed projects, their interest may be higher as a potential investment partner. We will expect any provider partner to develop and propose a project area business case with investment and a revenue performa. That should identify all required cost elements revenue projections to determine if and when a project will go cash flow break even and a positive to saying ongoing service and operations. How much funding is available and is there a match requirement? So the funding availability, as I said, the Y21 is 20 million, Y22 is 10 million, which will roll over for a total amount of 30 million. And yes, there is a match requirement. State funds will contribute no more than 50% of a total project cost. And those costs that best leverage state funds will receive most favorable consideration. The bro broadband grant program will provide up to 50% of capital requirements for a project, which requires at least 50% of capital contribution from other sources, including the service provider partners. Greater match contributions will receive favorable scoring. A maximum award amount per project is two million. So if a minimal match is 50% is met, then a project total with eligible cost could be four million. <clears throat> Which geographic areas are eligible for funding? Any unserved census block as determined by the Georgia Broadband Availability Map that is located in an eligible or conditionally eligible one Georgia County, not already included in USDA or RDOF funding is eligible to be included in a grant application. Grants will be competitively awarded and only those unserved locations within the unserved census block will receive funding. The broadband mapping team, as Eric illustrated earlier, is developing a grant eligibility map tool to assist applicants in identifying proposed project areas. So just to be clear, so first you go to the Georgia Broadband Availability Map, and if it's in a one Georgia eligible county, the census block is eligible. And then if the census block has not received federal funding through our 
FCC's RDOF or from ReConnect, <clears throat> it is eligible for state funding. <clears throat> As Eric illustrated earlier, we have the data and have collected the data to overlay to identify what census blocks remain unserved after these federal investments. <clears throat> As you can see on the left-hand screen, that is the Georgia broadband availability map. And on the right-hand side of the screen is the map with the overlay of RDOF investment. This is just one example to illustrate how we have been tracking these federal inve investments <clears throat> to make certain that we're expanding. As I said earlier, our intent at the state is to maximize and optimize <clears throat> all funding resources and all investments so that we can leverage state funding into those census blocks that remain unserved without any federal investment. <clears throat> Eric had also shared this screen. So this is where it becomes important to understand what tools are gonna to be available to you when you <clears throat> look to apply and to identify your proposed service area. The, we are creating a grant eligibility map through Eric's team. As you can see, the blue areas are the census blocks with the number of unserved, unserved locations. So if you look, these numbers illustrate the number of unserved locations. And these are the eligible census block that tells you the number of eligible locations <clears throat> that you can apply for for state funds. As Eric illustrated, the, the two will allow you through an additional to a lasso tool to identify the light green area illustrates a proposed service area where you can identify that proposed service area out of those census blocks that you wish to apply for funding. <clears throat> In addition, addition to the mapping tool to be able to see it at a census block, you will also be able to download um, an Excel spreadsheet that identifies each census block by in, census block number, the county, and the number of unserved locations in that <clears throat> census block for your proposed service area. <clears throat> in addition to considerations for broadband funding, broadband ready communities <clears throat> will also play a role um, so if you, um, to illustrate community readiness, we will look for the broadband ready community designation. Uh, many cities and counties have applied and are currently designated. We continue to get applications for that. So if you are interested in applying for that designation, number one, <clears throat> you are a community that has identified unserved areas through the Georgia broadband availability amount you wish and have a desire and interest in expanding broadband services to those unserved areas, you have adopted a local comprehensive plan that includes a broadband element, and then you have also adopted a model ordinance. All the information on how to apply and what the model ordinance is, a template of that model ordinance can be found on the broadband website. I do want to emphasize you do not, and I want to repeat, you do not have to be a broadband ready community in order to apply. <clears throat> you can apply, apply without the designation. The designation does, however, give you <clears throat> priority points in the evaluation in the scoring process. <clears throat> so just to go over the key <clears throat> areas that the evaluation criteria will be considered, as I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> unserved locations. So eligible applicant, unserved locations, unser unserved locations um, identify whether it's residential or if it's economic, which would be industrial parks, businesses, and those type facilities. A qualified broadband provider partner. <clears throat> As I said earlier, you can select that either through selecting it from the approved provider list or through your own local procurement process that is through a bidding process <clears throat> that follows your own procurement guidelines. Project capital cost. So <clears throat> as we mentioned earlier, we do have the tools to evaluate 
the reasonableness of the cost per location that is proposed in the project. So what does that look like? So you have an engineered design of your proposed project area with a cost associated to build out those specific unserved locations. And we'll evaluate <clears throat> that cost against <clears throat> our statewide model. It is intended that in order to maximize investments that those projects that are leveraging existing infrastructure would have a lower cost per location, therefore would be more competitive in an application. And then also capital contribution, as I said earlier, the minimum match is 50%, but if the contribution comes in higher, those two will <clears throat> lend priority points for those higher investments. And then lastly, as I mentioned on the previous slide is the community preparedness in the broadband ready designation. So these are the areas of evaluation and the criteria for what we will be scoring applications. So how do you apply? <clears throat> DCA is creating an online portal on our uh, website. There will be links to that on the Georgia Broadband Deployment Initiative website. There will be uh, two processes. First, there is a pre-app that you will go through and then uh, those who, who are successful through the pre-app process will be notified to move on to a full application. Uh, we will soon be releasing the NOFA that will, that will indicate when, in, when that application is available and where and when the win window opens. We anticipate accepting applications this summer. And on a final remark, you know, we have talked across the day and certainly there are multiple opportunities funding uh, beyond the state statewide program. So as you consider broadband infrastructure projects, regardless of the funding source, we also consider utilizing the broadband resources to guide investment decisions that maximize taxpayer dollars. Some upcoming events. We are holding a series of regional workshops beginning on May 13th um, that will run through the 20th. <clears throat> and these will be regional and we will talk more about the grant program and how do you apply, but how do you develop those projects and those project service areas. There will be the launch of the grant eligibility amount so that you can go to it to be begin developing those uh, project areas. And then the release of the notice of funding and that will, will give you the information on when to apply, where to apply and how to apply. And then we'll also follow up with a grant program workshop. The grant program workshop will be very specific to actually how do you go into the online portal and uh, submit an application. For information uh, on anything that we have discussed in this last um, portion of the grant program, please contact any of the ones on the, the screen. Uh, for general questions, you can use the local government assistance. Um, for those that are city or counties that have questions, for any designations, you can contact Brittany Hickam for MAP inquiries, Jason Sale. Um, and also for any general questions that is coming from someone that's not a local government, you can contact either Brittany or Jason and they'll reach out, out to me and we'll reach out to the, the, the broadband team as a whole, which is GTA, um, Eric and his team for any questions and any discussions that we might have. And we're happy to have one-on-one -on -one calls um, to get into specific details um, if we can guide and help you <clears throat> and answer questions regarding project development. So at this time, I will be happy to take any additional questions that you might have regarding the grant program. Yeah, Dana, we've, we've got one. Uh, it says, when will the qualified broadband provider list come out? Um, the, the approved provider list, uh, will come out somewhere at the beginning of June. Will that, will that be published with the uh, notice of funding availability? Um, yes, it will. Any other questions? Well, let's give them a minute. They're probably thinking about it. 
I, I know that we had um, in the last session with Eric with the mapping and data, we had um, questions that really kind of spilled over into the, the grant program. So maybe we have answered some of those, um, but happy to, to take any additional questions that, that anybody may have, have. And as we're rolling out additional information that is more specific to the program, um, <clears throat> we will be sharing it through those workshops. Um, again, you can contact us direct through uh, these uh, contacts that I have listed on the screen right now. Um, we got happy to work we have with two you. questions. We have two questions. Okay. Um, so, is there going to be a link to register for the workshop series? Uh, yes, there will be. And so, uh, right now, we um, so DCA has regional reps across the state, and they are working with regional commissions um, to prepare those workshops. Um, and they will share uh, the, re the registration and the contact information will go out um, through uh, our regional reps and our regional commissions. Another question, if, the, uh, if a provider is not on the first provider list, right, can they get on the list later? Yes, they can. Um, so you would have submitted and participated in the solicitation in order to be on the pr approved provider list. Then you have to sign uh, an MSA um, in order to be on the approved provider list. Here's one. Um, will the NOFA include details on material to be provided during the pre-app period and full app period? Um, so the NOFA will give notice, but the guidelines will get very specific um, in the pre-app and the full out. And the guy um, based at the time of the NOFA. Will workshops be presented online or only in person? So the, the regional workshops that we are planning, um, the, the, the speakers and the content, we will present virtually, um, but it will be up to each region where they hold it um, live in a hybrid fashion or um, if the audience and attendants will to gather at one location, but the speakers um, will be virtual. Um, <clears throat> another question, are maps available indicating where RDOF and USDA funding has been allocated? We currently do not have a public uh, publication of those RDOF funded areas. Um, one of the reasons why is that phase one RDOF um, is not complete, meaning that there is another step, which they call it and refer to as a long form. So that could change. And so we don't want to get out ahead with a publication uh, of uh, until we know, um, in fact, they're specific and, and there's a commitment to serve those locations. Somebody <clears throat> uh, put in the question, the link to the region 11 workshop on May 13th. Danny, you want me to put that in the chat? Uh, yes, please. If I can do that. Yep, looks like, there we go. Okay, got that one. Um, <clears throat> Kimberly says region 11 workshop is a hybrid virtual or in person at SGRC offices in Valdosta and Waycross. That sound right? That's great. Okay. Um, another question. When my organization submitted to be on the approved provider list, we registered but did not do more than that. You mentioned there were succeeding steps. Was that something prompted or something else? <laughs> well, if, if you registered in the, in the state vendor bid system, um, as the instruction said, then you should have received notices from the bid system about the uh, RFP and all the RFP materials for you to have uh, participated and submitted during the RFP. I think that's the right answer for that. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you have any further detailed question about that, I would suggest you reach out to uh, procurement, GTA procurement. <clears throat> Right. Any other any other questions? Uh, give them a minute. They're all thinking about it. 
<laughs> well, we, we, we are very much ahead of schedule, so we have time to you know, know. entertain and, and answer okay. questions that anyone might have. Let's see. Kathy says, here's the Region 2 workshop, which will be on May 18th at 3 o'clock, and here's the link to register, so I'll copy and paste that. Region 2. I don't know where Region 2 is. Where is that? Do you know, Dina? I don't have the regional mounts in front of me, so. Georgia Mountains. Georgia Mountains. There we go. That's what I would have guessed. That's yours, isn't it? No, that's not. That's the uh, northeast part, isn't it? Mm -hmm. They're my neighbors. Something I'll go ahead and say real quickly on the art off maps and the uh, USDA maps, uh, both the FCC and the USDA have preliminary maps available on their websites. If you want to look at that information, when we get gather that information up, we go to the source, which is the FCC or the USDA to get that information. I'll go get that and uh, put it in the, uh, put the FCC's map in the um link in the chat as soon as I get to it. Here we go. There it is. <clears throat> yes, and, and there you can find a wealth of information regarding art off. Um, yeah, I just put it in the chat window, so it's very colorful. Mm -hmm. It is indeed. And we, we had as we mentioned in the, um, if you attended and maybe some of you didn't, but in uh, Eric's session um, earlier, we talked about the art off investments and um, we talked about <clears throat> where those investments are being made and how with the data that we have, we are able to track um, the information so that we can see where investments are being made. Um, you know, we the solving solving the issue as I mentioned earlier, it, it has to do with cost. And so finding uh, funding sources that can wedge that financial gap that providers um, have a challenge with um, because it just doesn't make the business case to do it on their own is critical. So we're not looking for one, one funding source to solve it. We, we think it's a, a, a joint effort uh, among state, federal, local, and certainly private investment across those to find those solutions. We also um, think it could be uh, different type technologies. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the state's definition of broadband services um, is a uh, wired or, or um, terrestrial or wireless terrestrial um, service. Um, so that does not include um, satellite. Um, so we track those um, investments being made in those type technologies. Um, there, you know, there's uh, many across um, the nation um, who think that public money, and I tend to agree, um, should be invested in future-proof type technologies uh, for the long haul of, in, so that these services can continue. I mean, if we're going to put public money um, at work to solve and bring solutions, then we want to make sure these are solid long-term investments. So Dana, um, any sense of, uh, or any um, um, timeline when you, when we might see the NOFA come out? Summer, fall? Uh, summer, uh, uh, as early as June. So just around the corner. Do you want to uh, bring up the NTIA grant program that's about to be rolled out as well? Mm -hmm. So that's another funding source. Thank you, Bill, for reminding me of that one. Um, the NTIA also has a um, capital project uh, funding source where um, that is three million, three hundred million. Uh, for the nation. Obviously, that's not a lot of money, but yet it is, it is one more resource of funding um, that's, that could be available to, uh, 
to um, those interested in uh, working with states, local governments in solving uh, for connectivity issues. Um, I emphasize uh, what we heard this morning. Um, today was uh, really a great series of presentations on how it has affected um, education, uh, teleworking, um, all of these uh, that have tapped into and utilizes these online resources as a result of COVID. But we at the, in the broadband office, we've been working on this for going on three years. So we knew that this problem existed, but COVID just highlighted it because we all had to transition to um, an online lifestyle. And unfortunately, um, some didn't have um, the connectivity that would support some of the application needs. But what we have seen is that we can certainly make our economies more robust, especially in the rural areas with having access to internet. Um, with the transition to teleworking, working, you can live anywhere almost now and, and work from home. Um, so that certainly means greater opportunities in rural areas um, and certainly for uh, employers, a larger pool of employees um, if teleworking suits um, suit, suits that um, work environment, so um, we had, many had talked about earlier in the earlier presentations how <clears throat> yes, all of this was in response to COVID, but there are so many practices um, that are really good practices that will go on and will be implemented moving forward and will really change the way that we uh, do a lot of things different. Um, we heard certainly from education how things that they have done in, in response to COVID will continue because they have been they have found ways that they have worked well. Obviously, it's not the only answer. Um, and we talked about education, teleworking. Um, telehealth is um, definitely another area um, that stands to benefit from uh, robust internet service in rural areas. More and more we're seeing where um, um, hospitals and medical facilities um, are closing and limiting the resources available to the residents of, of those communities. Well, now with the opportunity for telemedicine, you can bring services to someone rather than that person having to go out and seek those services. Um, you know, way before COVID, we had issues with um, healthcare where people were homebound. And so we were trying to find ways um, and really it had to do with transporting, transportation, transporting those patients to the medical facilities for treatments. Well, now we can bring those services to them through telemedicine, which was always there, but now we're just learning more and more just how, how many tools are available to us for that. Any other questions? Yep. <laughs> Do the GBDI program rules allow for the community to transfer the assets to the provider at some point in the future? So um, as I mentioned earlier, um, it's governed by One Georgia. So it's um, uh, the program is going to be very similar to other infrastructure projects where there is um, a short-term lease agreement between uh, the provider partner and the applicant um, with the transfer of assets at a later time, transfer of ownership at a later time in the short term, which is probably five to seven years. See, I told you they were thinking about questions. Mm -hmm. I just put in the link, the uh, approved grant program rules on, on the DCA website, Dina. <clears throat> okay. Um, do you want to say anything about the program expectations of the role and responsibility of the uh, chosen provider or providers with a local government applicant? <clears throat> yeah, but because, um, you know, we, we do see this as um, an investment on behalf of the provider. And the opportunity for the lease with the transfer of ownership, we do um, expect that the provider would 
come and bring um, the match. Uh, as I said earlier, the minimum of, of 50%. What about the resources to develop the application, the pre-app and the full app? Um, obviously, um, if we are looking for providers who can edge out their network to be the ideal co well, I'm not, well, pro provider partner, let me clarify that, provider partner, um, then they have the expertise, the knowledge of their network, their existing network, and how they um, can identify the ideal the service area meeting the eligibility service requirements um, to help design that network and understand the cost associated with it um, and what um, the network is, is, is needed and required in order to provide those services. All right, here's, here's a, a refined question of the earlier question. Will the provider be allowed to own the assets associated with its match day one and then transfer the state matched assets to its ownership at a later date? Um, I think that's a more complicated question that we can talk about offline. Um, so that, so you say at the beginning, what, you know, what does the beginning mean? Um, obviously there is an expectation of performance across a certain a, a performance period in which, um, <clears throat> Initially, it is expected that there would be a lease agreement <clears throat> with trans the ownership of assets transferring at the end of that lease agree agreement, which is, I, as I explained before, is a short-term lease um, across the uh, closeout or performance period, which is five to seven years. Well, if you, can I throw you a hypothetical? Sure. I'll do my best to answer it. Well, let's give it a shot. So. Okay. You have a project and it proposes to build out 500 miles of fiber, right? To do fiber to the home, right? So you have cable as an eligible capital cost and you have electronics, right? <clears throat> I think what they're asking is if they spend their own money and just their own money on whatever part of it is, right? Don't they have total title and ownership of that? But when they use state money, right? To pay for part of the capital cost, that's the asset that has um, local government title title name on it until the end of the period and the transfer occurs. Does that make sense? Yes, I, yes, I think I understand what the hypothetical is. So, <clears throat> so the portion of the project that has state funds invested in it um, would be the portion that we're, we are saying would be some sort of a lease agreement um, and then ownership, transfer of ownership at the end of a period of time. Well, the point he's making is that service providers who borrow money to provide their part of the investment money, right, will need to keep ownership of what they fund to secure with the banks. So I don't know, maybe that's something you can get into uh, in a workshop, but right. <clears throat> that, that's a comment. Right, and, and, and you know, and I, I understand that the, the challenge there in order to uh, provide the match, they may have to um, <clears throat> um, borrow the money. And in order to borrow the money, they have to have title. So I, I understand there's, there, there could be some challenges with that. So um, we can talk about that offline. Is it, is it joint title on the state funded assets or is it, how does that work? Is that, is that true? Is that the case? It's a joint title with the provider's name on it and the local government applicant's name on it, or is it just the local government applicant name on title? So again, um, I'll, I would just have to do okay. that offline. Okay. It's getting in the weeds. Yes, it is. Hey, we've arrived. If we're getting in the weeds, we're there, right? Well, these are all really, really good questions and I, I appreciate them. Um, and uh, can and happy to talk further about those offline, uh, and then also give you know thought to how those challenges could be addressed. Thank you, Dana. Well, that I think is the last question.
So I want to thank you for uh, supporting the uh, summit and thank attendees for coming here today. Uh, Joe Coberly, are you there? You want to have the final word as we close out the day? I'm here, Bill. Thank you, Joe. Well, that's it for our uh, GTA Technology Summit for 2021. Thanks, Bill and Dina, for closing it up. And uh, I want to thank everyone there for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us. I'm Joe Coberly with GTA. We'd like to hear your comments, so shoot me an email. Uh, if you've got something, I'll put it in the uh, chat box down there. Um, I want to thank our sponsors, Merlin. Uh, they do modeling of digital expertise and compliance points, cybersecurity services for their support and the great information they brought. I want to thanks, uh, say thanks. I'm going to say thanks to a lot of folks here. So uh, I'll try to do it fast, like an award ceremony or something. But thanks to DCA Commissioner Nunn for kicking it off today. Thanks to Georgia CIO and GTA Executive Director Calvin Rhodes for kicking it off uh, yesterday and for all the guidance with the summit. Thanks to Brittany Cleland and the Georgia Center for Continuing Education for solid technical support throughout this process. Thanks to the Georgia Broadband Program, Broadband Program and all the presenters uh, for, throughout the summit for making it valuable. And special thanks to everyone who has put in long hours to make this uh, virtual summit happen. It wasn't easy, but I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, send me your comments, uh, recommendations through the email in the chat. And uh, Without further ado, thanks a lot and uh, have a great rest of your week. Thanks, Joe. Have a good one. You too, Bill.